Jessica Lynn, a professional speaker and outspoken advocate of transgender rights. Ms. Lynn is president and co-founder of the nonprofit group Your True Gender and has spoken all across America about her truth and has taken time out of her busy schedule to come to Olympia and join us today. Thank you for being here, Jessica. Thank you for having me. Let's start off with, tell us a little bit about yourself. I am a 51-year-old woman. I knew at a very, very young age that a lot of us in the trans population knew. I knew at three, four years old, but I was born in a different time period. You know, I'm born in 1965, and when I was a young child, I thought I was the only human being on the planet that felt like this. So I went through life living a facade. I went through and, and had the same struggles as a lot, a lot of people did, but plus a little bit more. You know, being in this body that I didn't feel comfortable with at a very, very young age. I did, as you hear a lot of people did, took a razor blade to my penis when I was about seven years old. Very common. And I lived the fake life. And I finally, when I was 17 years old, I came out to a girlfriend and I fully came out to her and she fully accepted me. And I thought it was going to be fixing me and cure me forever. And... Um, and I proposed to her and we started planning our lives together. But then in 1985, a drunk driver hit us and killed her. And so my life went into the total, total toilet for about a year and a half. And, um, and I drank and I used a lot of drugs and I just attempted suicide numerous times. And I finally came to when I had a meeting with my parents and it came to that my parents had always known about me wanting to be a girl at a very very young age and they had planned on transitioning me when I was five years old and so this was a very bittersweet moment for me but I finally came to truth with myself and I went back and forth about transitioning back and forth and I started planning on my transition in the late 80s and during my planning period I met a young girl and she was my friend, and, and I pretty much came out to her, and she accepted me. And, um, but I slept with her a few times, and I ended up getting her pregnant. So we got married. I put my transition behind me, and we had two small children. And um, when I, we ended up, I just couldn't be with the woman anymore. We ended up finally divorcing in about 1996, what I remember. And long story short, we ended up getting back together briefly and having a third child and could not get along again. And then it went through a huge legal battle in the state of California where it was brought forth that I am a transgender and that I want to be with a man. And the judge did not care. And in California, after a three-year legal battle that cost me about $65,000, the judge gave me full legal physical custody of all of my three children. And this went on, and so I was raising, I was a single father raising three boys, doing a damn good job. Long story short, my ex-wife was in a bad car accident. During her recovery period, I let her come back into our house, and we started discussing me transitioning. And she said, I will help you come back and, you know, transition into the woman. I will be your friend. So I let her back in the household. I put her through schooling, and she... We made about upon a deal, and I put like I said, we raised the children as a family. And after a couple of years, she graduated. My eldest son graduated high school, and I let them take. I let her take the three children to the state of Texas, while I stay behind and my, do my transition. In Christmas of 2009, I flew to Texas and came out to my eldest son, which in turn fully, fully, 100% accepted me and came back to California and helped me do my transition. I came out to my middle son before my transition and he fully, fully accepted me, came out to California, had no problem. I had my surgery, I transitioned, I had my surgery in, in September of 2010. And then when the deal was that my youngest would know, I came out to my wife and I said, ex-wife, and I said, it's time we tell our youngest, Curtis. She in turn filed a lawsuit, which she took me to the state of Texas. They made me jump through some incredible hoops. 
I surpassed all of those hoops, but the judge would not allow any of the evidence in and ended up removing all of my parental, parental rights to my youngest child, who was 12 years old at the time. And for the first time in U.S. history, removed a name off a child's birth certificate, a parent's name off a child's birth certificate due to gender transition. And so because of this, I become a huge advocate. And I travel the country and I go from, I started doing it in California and it started to grow. And this semester alone, since January, what are we at right now, May, since January, I've spoken to about 44 different universities from coast to coast, anywhere from Florida to Alabama to Mississippi to um, I just two days ago, I was in Washington State here at Eastern Washington University. And I spoke at Central Washington University. And I go and I help people understand. Some of the schools I do eight, nine lectures in during my two or three day period. And I travel and the way I look at it is these young students are our future teachers, our future doctors, our future parents, and our future congressmen, and our future senators, and maybe our future presidents. And if they can be accepting of people such as ourselves, we're helping change the future world. So there will be no more judges saying, you can't see your child. There will be no more people saying, you can't use this restroom. We need people to accept us for who we are. That's my goal. And so and it's been taken over really, really well. And so we started Your True Gender to help fund this. We started, it's a 501c3 based out of California. Me and my friend Peggy Jones put together this 501c3. And we started, we worked together with a lot with Dr. Marcy Bowers, Dr. Joel Beck, and quite a few other surgeons and people in the community and we're trying to spread awareness as far as we can reach. Next year I am going out out of the country. I've been invited to Australia, to Canada, to New Zealand and so but we have a lot of work to do here in the States first. And that's I want to concentrate my effort on. You know? So mm -hmm. that's basically what we're doing. And we also with our other resources we held a conference in California in San Luis Obispo last October 9th, tenth and eleventh, your true gender did. And and it was one of the best conferences in the country last year. We had some of the best professionals, and it was rated as one of the best, and it was our first one. It was incredible. So that's what, a long story short, that's what yeah. uh, Well, thank you for, that, for uh, sharing that much. I mean, that was a pretty good summarization. Yeah. I could go on for two hours, but I won't. <laughs> Um, let's see, um, you touched a little bit about it, um, but when did you first realize that you did not identify with the gender that you were assigned to birth? I'm right about four years old, three to four years old. I did not feel comfortable in my own skin. My mom recently did an interview and she found me with a pair of scissors in my bathtub trying to cut off my penis at three years old, okay? I hated, hated, but... In 1969, 70, the most you saw, you saw Bobby Brady on TV. If you saw him in a dress, everybody's pointing at him, laughing at him. And I, why would I want to be pointed at, laughed at? It was tearing me apart. I had no idea. I thought I was the only human being that felt this way on the planet, you know. And it wasn't just I wanted to wear shoes or I wanted to wear this. I just didn't want my hair. Look. I didn't want to just look like a girl. I wanted to be a mother. I watched my sister walked down the aisle, marry her boyfriend, and at seven years old, eight years old, I was fantasizing about being her. And that tore a child apart at that age. Mm -hmm. Did not know how to comprehend it. So I knew at a very, very young age. Would you find quite common? Not everybody. We are all unique. I have friends that didn't know until 18 years old. I've had friends that don't know until 40 years old. But more common kids know it, people know it at a young age. You know? mm, I do understand. That was kind of the same with me. I was really young. I mean, the first thing I ever bought myself was a little my size princess dress up costume. And I was four years old and I begged and I threw a fit in the store until my mom let me get it because it was my own Christmas money for the first time that year. <laughs> and um, I remember turning it on or putting it on and it just like I didn't turn me into a girl, but I did wear it, you know, I thought, you know, because I was so little, I was like, this will turn me into a girl. Yeah. My mom, when I was a child, was a big, she was ba basically a Catholic coming from England, you know, raised in the Catholic Church, 
and said, if you pray hard enough, God will move mountains. God will move mountains. So I was on my hands and knees in front of that bed every single night saying, God, please, please, please turn me into a girl. Please. And I'm begging him and waking up in the morning saying, please, God, please, please. And I did that for years. And then finally I'm saying, you cannot turn me into a girl. Take these feelings of wanting to be. I remember just praying, saying, just take these feelings of wanting to be a girl away from me. I was like you, playing with my very, very best friend, Michelle Gorman, coming home playing dolls, playing tea party, painting our fingernails, playing dress up, and I could do that with her. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And um, and then our, my, our parents, my her mother started pushing it away, you know? And um, so, yeah, it's very, very, very common. You know? It is. And I wish I would have been more outspoken at that age, you know? Don't we all? I can understand, you yeah. know, back in your time, it was just, that was just not, yeah. that was just not okay. Even in your time, how Even in my think? time, I mean, I would have, it would have been the early 90s. Yeah. You know, like, I, I'm in, I was born in 86. Okay. So, so, yeah. I'm 20 years older than you, yeah. And, I mean, so, like, what kind of feelings or emotions when, you know, were you experienced when you first realized that, you identified differently like when do you remember the emotions I mean we all remember the emotions but do you remember like around the time that you started like how it affected you and what you felt it it was like a little torture my mom reflects on the stuff and she saw it because she knew okay and and it was like I was tortured I became introverted Right? I would just hide from the world. I had three brothers, and they would go play, and I didn't want to go that. I'm going to my friend Michelle's Gorman, and they're pulling me away saying, come on, we're going to go ride bicycles, and I didn't want to do it. And I used to, one of my things is I did coping mechanisms. I became in, in, so involved in different, different activities, I started bug collecting. Right, So that was, like I said, when here I am, three, four, not three, but four, five, six years old, and I'm collecting bugs, and I'm focused all my time and energy. I'd come home from school and just concentrate on my bug collection before school, and I'd do caterpillars, and caterpillars, I had butterfly trees, and caterpillars, you know, you got a monarch, um, you have a, a caterpillar that goes into a cocoon and hangs from the trees. I had these butterfly trees, this is what I used to focus on. So you get these caterpillars, they live off milk, weed and then they go into a cocoon for 21 days or whatever the time was and it came out a beautiful creature and here I was at four or five six years old saying maybe one day I can come out that beautiful creature so you know and that's just like this fantasy so I started going from bug collecting and then it turned into stamp collecting I had the best bitch in stamp collection out of everybody you know and it was stamp collecting I would focus on it my brother did coins and that kind of stuff then that got old and then I started doing art, uh, photography and artwork, and I became a damn good artist. I could show you paintings of mine, it was just like, your mind would blow away. But when I was in that piece of artwork, when I was drawing something, my mind, I became into that artwork. I would draw and paint and focus constantly. I became a master artist at 11, 12, 13 years old. That's just master, you know, mm -hmm. beautiful stuff. But around this age too, my <coughs> parents were English immigrants, okay? And they introduced, I had three brothers, and they introduced us to the game of soccer. And I really didn't feel like playing soccer because boys played soccer, girls didn't. Mm -hmm. But I go to the soccer field, and there was girls kicking the ball around, so I started playing. And I found, when I was on the soccer field, my mind was off this wanting to be a girl, and I found it as a huge coping mechanism. And I became obsessed with it. And it was a way, like I said, going through puberty. I mean, and, and again, going through puberty, I wanted to be a, with a girl with boys. I had this fantasy to be, I had crushes on my teammates. I had this fantasy of being there, but you couldn't do it. This is now 1978, 70, you know what I'm saying? There's just mm -hmm. no way. So I played soccer and played soccer and I'd get up v swore school and kick the ball against my le against the garage door with my left foot. I'd read books on Franz Beckenbauer, Stanley Matthews, George Best, the best players of my period, Johan Cruyff, and I would focus and play and play. And so I obsessed with it and I became a damn good soccer player and um, when I was 15 years old I had um, four scholarship offers 
and I was asked to try out for the 1984 Olympic team. That's how good I became. And the reason I point this out a lot is you have recently have, you have Caitlyn Jenner that's come out, mm -hmm. like her, dislike her. That was her coping mechanism, was when she became the world's greatest athlete. Mm -hmm. You have Christian Beck, back east, that she's a Navy SEAL. I have a friend here in the Bay Area, it's a, a Green Beret. That's the toughest of the toughest, and she came out in transition. And it's the coping mechanism. You find it a lot. You find a lot of people in the trans community join the military. Today, this will make me more of a man. It'll cure me. It'll fix me. Mm -hmm. It'll make me. So it's very, very common. That's what I did. And that's at a very, very, very young age. Coping mechanism became immersed. And that's the way I dealt with this turmoil as I got older it became more difficult and more difficult and more difficult if that makes sense you know it does yeah. it does make a lot of sense because my coping mechanism I came from like the Sega era so my coping mechanism was video Playing games video games and, and I would then, immerse myself in games for hours and hours and hours and hours of the same thing over and over just to a good friend of mine's that way right mm -hmm. Man Mandy Howard she's um and you may have read about her about a year or two ago. She's a San Quentin prison guard, right? She does the same thing. She's a San Quentin prison guard that came in and transitioned on the job, right? Same thing, coping mechanism as video mm -hmm. games, you know? And it's very, very common, and it's just a way to pull your mind off this, God, I wish I could wear those shoes. God, I wish I could go there with that mm -hmm. boy. And it is not always boy or girl, whatever, but it's just that mindset, you know? And mm -hmm. um, That mindset of, I wish I could do this, but I just can't. Yeah, because society says you can't, mm -hmm. you know? And we end, and uh, me, uh, even a little different time period, it, you just, there's nobody, nobody in the world that said you can't do it. There was nobody. You know, there were, but it was very few and far between. Later, when I was 15, 14 years old, I saw the girl, um, Carolyn Cossey, did it on James Bond. But I only saw he was on a day talk show and was like, wow, there is somebody, you know? And I didn't know anything about the surgeries. It was just a very, very brief thing that I saw, you know? Mm -hmm. and I'm like, wow. And part of my thing is, is like with surgeries, in the trans community, there's a million shades of gray, okay? And this is what I really explain when I talk to students is <coughs> just I when I transitioned, when I started wanting to do it full time, I did not want to be that girl with the penis, okay? When I started learning about this stuff, I would look at the most you would see was the back of um, Hustler, Penthouse, these hardcore, not Playboy, but these hardcore magazines, and you saw lady boys or she males and chicks with dicks. There's nothing wrong with that. But I didn't want to be that. I wanted to be a female, a mother, a wife. I wanted to be that. And when I was starting my transition, I didn't see it, if that makes sense. I didn't want to be halfway. I wanted to be that mm -hmm. woman. And there's nothing wrong. Um, people all over the world, they have that different shades of gray. And in the trans community, there is just no two are alike, mm -hmm. okay? And this is, I mean, we don't need this person to say, okay, this is the role model. You have to be like this. You have to have a sex change, become a full woman. No, you don't. Who am I to tell you or you or you how you feel, what body parts you shouldn't have, and what you shouldn't have, you know? It's none of the rest of the world's business. So I know I go on the sound. <laughs> No, I, I, I agree. It's nobody's business. Yeah. I mean, you wouldn't ask... I mean, I believe an analogy that you used, or no, some I saw an analogy used recently that's like you wouldn't ask someone walking down the street, hey, what yeah. genitals do you have? Like, yeah. how do you have sex? Yeah. You know, I mean, it's like you just, you, you just don't think about it that way. You know, I mean, it's just walking up to the guy and saying, huh. How big, you know, how big is your penis? I have and, for yeah. all these Republicans that are against trans bathroom access is why do you think that being in the bathroom is a sexual thing? No, it's <laughs> what it is with the, with the Republicans and the thing is, and this is kind of the way I figure it is and what we've really been discussing, um, a few of us, is they lost to the gay rights movement where they lost. And, they, and this is the weakest of the link right now. We have to be in power. They did it to the black community how many years ago saying that you have to be in a different chain of mm -hmm. mountain. The black movement came up. It's still the most discriminated people in the world right now are the trans community. And even more is the black trans women. That is the most discriminated oh, yeah. one in the world, okay? And there's still, there's so much hatred for us just because we look a little bit different. But the way I look at it is, it, that was Hitler's idea. Let's keep everybody blonde hair, blue eyes, this side. And what a boring world that way. Wouldn't that be just a boring, boring world? I mean, look at the round in the, you know, I speak to classrooms anywhere from 20 students to 2,000, okay, all across the country. And I'll say, in this room alone, look at all the unique ability. Everybody 
everybody is different. We all have our own same things, but yet some people want to put us in a box, a male box and a female boxes. Let's lose those labels. Let's get rid of gender, queer, transgender. Let's get to this. Let's lose everything. You're a human being, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, what you like, it's going to be different. We're both trans women, but what you like is going to be different than what I like, okay? I like my transition is definitely more, it's definitely different from yours. Yeah, no chore like. Path. Yes, and this Everyone's is what we got to get, path. and mainly to the trans community you don't have to follow certain guidelines. You do have to follow certain guidelines to some things for some doctors, but they're lessening that now and now. But who am I to say to you, you can't wear that. You have to do this to become who you are. Mm -hmm. I've done panels with full chicks with beards, okay? That's their choice. Who am I to tell her that she can't wear that beard? You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? So, mm -hmm. you know, I teased her a little bit, but <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just yeah. kidding. Um, let's see, um, well, we kind of covered what are some of the strategies that you have found helpful in overcoming stresses that you have from yeah. anxiety, depression, and just being, having everything going on with you, but what was your, what was your favorite one that you did? What was the favorite strategy that you used, or what was your favorite thing to do to kind of escape? Like your most favorite out of all the things you've done to escape the doldrum what was your favorite well you know not the doldrum but you know i remember just being i would pretend i was sick from school and then i had as most of the trans women do we had little secret stashes of clothes here and there i remember on my wall I had an intercom system at whatever 12 13 years old i had an intercom system had four screws in it i'd tell my mom i'm sick she would leave go do whatever her thing is i'd take those things out and be able to dress up for that day you know what i'm saying but then the it felt good to be able to dress up but the torture was taking it off and putting it back into that wall. That was absolutely torture because I just didn't feel like, I just felt like being that girl. And it wasn't just being able to dress, but it felt me, it, I was felt a little bit closer. But in other words, in other aspects, what was my way, the, my very best way of coping was soccer. I enjoyed it. I did enjoy the game of soccer. I still like to watch this good soccer game. Of course, we love to see David Beckham play. And to yeah. me, he's still, he's probably the best player that has ever lived in my eyes. You know, he may have a different view, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, but that he, to me, is, you know, I was a big um, Franz Beckenbauer fan. You know, he's a midfielder and he put the ball. But I, enjoy, I enjoyed the game. It was, I enjoyed it. I really, really did. Um, but it was a coping mechanism because when I was in the field and when I started coming out to my girlfriend, you know, she accepted me, the soccer went away, if that makes sense, you know. And, yes, um, yes. And it, um, and it just became, she was accepting of me. And then it went towards the latter part of her life is when um, it was starting, I was 20 years old and it was starting to build up and it caused a lot of fights between me and her because as you go older, you can't suppress it. Mm -hmm. We all think that as we get older, we can suppress it. It just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. Finally, it came to me at 45 years old and I just said, I could not live another day. And I went through this whole suicide thing and I finally just said, I have to. You have to do it, you know. A psychologist said, what is better, a dead father or a father that's now a woman? Came out to my two older children. They were fully accepting. Mm, so, yeah. Well, that, that's really, that's really nice. I mean, that's really, that's really good. Um, I don't have any kind of response. <laughs> I mean, you're so good at answering. Um, I mean, you did touch on it in... I guess, no, we don't have to do the having attempted suicide right there. Um, I can tell you how many times I've, you know, got slices on my wrists. I've swallowed pills. My last big suicide attempt I spent, um, I didn't know how to handle a lot, a lot of stuff. My kids had moved away, and I lost it. I hadn't slept in four days. I would just cry and cry. I didn't know whether to transition or not and cry. And nobody at home had to fall asleep at 1 o'clock in the morning, waking up at 3, just sitting in bed crying and crying and crying. Finally, one day I swallowed a whole bottle of pills, and I told a friend, I, I swallowed eight pills, and I called a friend. I said, I'm going to sleep now. I'm going to go take a nap. I swallowed eight pills. He got scared, called my brothers, and on the way home I swallowed the whole bottle of pills. And they came and kicked down my door and brought in the fire department, and they rushed me to the hospital. And I went into... Um, ICU and they pumped me and did all that thing. I was in the hospital 
and I finally went into critical care and they put me, they had a nurse stand over for me for 24 hours and that's when I spent 10 days in a psychiatric hospital and I met a doctor and he says, what is better? A dead father, or, came out of the hospital, started my transition. Once I started my transition, I never, ever thought of suicide again. Once I started living true to myself, done. I haven't had a thought since, okay? It, completely gone. Completely it really gone. is amazing how quickly that need to just end it all fades when you are accepted for who you are. Yeah or loved for who you are, because I, I do understand the suicidal urges and suicidal ideations, because I did attempt it a lot, yeah. and I did break the odds, and yeah. I, mean, I'm, I mean... And people say, oh, if you really wanted to die, you would have been dead. We do want to die. We didn't like being who we are. You know what I'm saying? It probably mm -hmm. the same thing as you. I looked it up to chance, you know, Russian yeah. roulette. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I hate to talk about it in front of my mom, so I'm not going to brush that too much, but... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's only so many times that you can play that game before you just get it. it get yeah. the point. My brother walked in on me once, and I had a shotgun in my mouth. You know, and mm -hmm. I just I was sat there crying and crying. And he calmed me out of it. You know, got me out of it, and um, and just that kind of stuff. So yeah, and like I said, I have marks on my things. I swallowed pills. I've just done so much crazy stuff to push the limit to say, you know. And, it's like kind of like a dare. What are you, yeah. what are you gonna do to me? Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 Um, so let's let's get off the subject the subject of suicide and move on to sex. No, I'm just kidding. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, we we could, but you know, that would be a little weird for being on camera. Uh, no. um, what age were you when you began your transition? When you were finally able to start being your true self every day? Well, or I went through a period when I came out to my parents. Part of my story is okay. And which is really part of my really powerful story is um, I was drinking and using a lot and uh, for a year and a half after my girlfriend died, okay? I was using a lot of cocaine. Cocaine became my drug of choice. I would smoke it, I would snort it, and I didn't inject, I didn't in, in, use needles, but I became a, a cocaine addict and an alcoholic. And I would drink and drink and everything like this. And finally, a friend of mine called me and goes, let's go see your parents. And it was prearranged, and I never knew it. We, my parents, my dad had since retired, and they were living up in Yosemite. I slept for a few hours, and my mom goes, Jeff, let's go for a walk. And we sit on this rock overlooking Yosemite, you know, just a beautiful valley. And my mom turns to me, and she says, me and your dad want you to stop drinking. And I argued with her, I don't have a drinking problem. She goes, we know why you start, you, you drink. And I argued because Barbara died. You know, my fiance is dead and buried. She goes, no, we know you want to be a girl. We've known ever since you've been three, four years old. And I remember getting up from her really, really pissed and yelling at her that she had always known and I had lived 23 years of absolute, absolute hell. And it came out that moment on the rock that my parents had planned on transitioning me when I was five years old and I never knew it. My dad had worked for IBM and put a request in to go to Riverside, and during that move, I was gonna start living full time. But my parents took me to the world famous John Money when I was five years old. He took me, he had a stint at UCLA. My, he told my parents that he's a boy. You raise him as a boy, it'll cure him. All right? you know about John Money. Um, I don't necessarily. Okay, John Money is considered the god of transsexuality. <coughs> In his eyes, it was nurture, not nature. And his theory was, it's you raise him as a boy, you keep him away from boys, keep him away from girl things, and it'll cure him, it'll fix him. Do you remember, and you've probably heard about this, where there's two young infants were born, they were twins, two boys at, a, at my time, and they circumcised the boys. And one of the boys, they cut off his penis, right? They brought John Money. They couldn't glue that penis back on. They couldn't reattach it. The nerves, says it's an infant, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever, two, three days old, the boy gets in and is circumcised. So they brought John Money and he says, you take the leftover skin, you transition him to a girl, you raise this little boy as a girl. This child will never, ever know that she was born a boy. So they did this transition. They said, birth certificate said a girl and a boy. They did it like that. This was, you know, 1966, 67. So this little girl grew up hated being a boy, was always attracted to girls, a tomboy, hated, hated, committed suicide when she was 18 years old. Okay, her brother followed suit after her. John Money goes, I was wrong. So this was the expert, and he told my parents, because it was right around the same time, he says, 
this is a boy, you keep him away from boy things. So it was a very bittersweet moment, but that was the day I sobered up, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And um, so right then and there, I kind of transitioned. I was living at my parents, I was shaving my body down, I'm letting my hair grow. I was started planning on transition, but then we did not know that you can have surgeries, right? There was mm -hmm. nothing out there, there was no internet, no magazines, you know what I mean? There were, but where do you find them? We had big of encyclopedias, we lived in Yosemite. We had no idea, I had no idea where to, to turn to. And so um, it went back and forth. So I lived part time with my parents. I kind of transitioned, but I didn't want to be halfway. And so I, when I finally, finally came out in 2009, I didn't live full time in 2009, but I came out to my child and I started on HRT in 2009 and I transitioned in 2010 is when I started living full time in Memorial Day of 2010. And um, and like I said, when I came out and said I'm gonna transition was the last time I ever had suicide thoughts because I was living part time, I was part time as a man, part time as a woman, but I was no which way I was going and my two children were already behind me, you know, so. So yeah, 2010 is when I started my transition. By September of 2010, I have had I had my GRS, I had my breast implants, and I had my trach, trach shave by Marcy Bowers in Colorado. Shortly after that, I came to Portland, Oregon with Dr. James Thomas and he did my vocal cords. And then after that, Dr. Beck did my chin, he did my nose, did rhinoplasty, shortened my upper lip. Um, and then just last August, he did my forehead and he did a fat plant transplant, you know? Mm -hmm. So I mean, one question I have personally is, um, what was the, was it a huge difference for the vocal cord surgery? I mean, it was, was it was, was like? yeah, I had one of the deepest voices you can imagine. A very, very deep voice. I tried, uh, you know, I didn't try to Kathy Perez, and she's known for it, but I couple, tried a couple of people in, in San Luis Obispo. It's very difficult. You're a man for 45 years to go change. I mean, you kind of know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. um, but I couldn't do it. I mean, you have all your transitioning all at once, and it's just... So I found a doctor, and Dr. James Thomas in Portland, Oregon, and it was, I think the surgery alone was either nine or $12,000. I can't remember. I saved up and I, you know, did this whatever. And I went out there and he did my surgery and he cut my neck open and he took my vocal cords and he cut them in half and he stretched them. And what I remember, and I may be wrong, but this had only been done 75 times. He invented this surgery mm -hmm. and he removed about 80% of my vocal box. And um, I couldn't talk. I physically could not go uh, for about a week or two. It was a scary, scary surgery, but I am pleased. Um, it may sound like I'm a smoker, okay, it may sound, but the difference is night and day to me. It's mind-boggling. I don't get surd. I haven't been surd in years, even on the phone, you know? It just mm -hmm. it just doesn't. And um, But that was my, when, when, when I transitioned, that was my number one, number one dead giveaway, as I thought in my head. But, you know, people read, and they were just pleasant, and they were nice. But I haven't been, I haven't really been misgendered, and I can't even remember how long, you know. And mm -hmm. um, so, and, and I'm lucky, I mean, knock on wood, you know. Mm -hmm. But, you know. I mean, that's how I kind of feel. I get this fork with my voice. Hearing see, I don't see it. I don't see like it. I don't. TV, it just it gets me. I see. I don't see it bad. You know, I don't see it bad, but I don't see it in you, right? You know what I'm saying? But mm -hmm. I'm also part of the community. You know. Yeah. No, I I understand. It's mm -hmm. like everyone sounds different in their own head, but yeah. but it's the truth. I, can, I, can I don't talk really well. Like, without even <laughs> talk, you know, trying. That's scary. No, I'm scared. <laughs> so, That's good. I mean, but going up here, it's, you know, I tr yeah. it took me a while to train to get up here, but yeah. I was really considering having the vocal surgery as well yeah but there's a, there are people in korea these days there are people in korea that do it and i said this to dr thomas i saw him at um, christmas time i think in december and um and i asked him about that because i have another friend a, friend a girlfriend of mine in california and they do it it's all non they do it through the nose and he goes, he's always repairing those guys. They come back to the States and it just doesn't work properly. And he's repairing and revolt, you know. So I don't know, you know. Um, mm -hmm. I've heard night and days on their recordings, but mm -hmm. who knows. I know what mine was compared to what it was. I am pleased. You may sound me, but I'm a 51-year-old person, right? And if you had heard me before, 
it's night and day. It's completely night and day. But if you look at me, listen to me now, I may sound like I smoke or whatever. It has a little bit of raspy, but a lot of guys, they like it. They say it's sexy, you know? Mm -hmm. So it works for Can't me. Can't complain with that. Yeah. I mean, talking about vocal surgeries and everything, it's a great segue into our next question, which is what has been your experience in finding trans-competent healthcare professionals? I mean, like... For I instance, I, this is one of my reasons why I started your, your true gender, right? Sam, in my area, okay? I dated a guy and I went in, when you have your surgery, okay? You have to have your surgery and for the first month, I kind of remember what the thing is, you have to dilate. They teach you to dilate because they take your penis, turn it inside out and they make your vagina out of it. You know, mm -hmm. they use your body parts and part of the daily care is you have to dilate. At first, you're doing it three times a day, three 15 minutes, stints, and it's twice a day and then it's once a day, all right? And then what you have to is let, unless you're having sex, all right? Then you, you know, the sex covers as that dilating because you're been penetrating the whole nine yards, mm -hmm. right? So I started dating a guy at six weeks, at five weeks. So I was very early on. I had sex at six weeks in a day or something like that. And I started dating a guy, but about a year into my surgery, I was having problem dilating. I'm putting a dilator in and blood is coming off. I called Dr. Bowers in Colorado, right? She says, um, I'm sorry, her office was in Colorado. She was still in moving and she was now in the Bay Area, but she was just still reorganizing. And she said, um, Robin said, go find a local gynecologist and go see her. So I go into a gynecologist, make an appointment with a local gynecologist, put my legs in a stirrup. She looks at me, she doesn't even open me up. And she goes, it's granulation tissue. And I said, it's coming from the inside. She goes, nope, it's when you pull the dilator out, it's hitting here around your clitoris and it's, it's granulation tissue. Here's, an, here's a prescription, $175 ointment, put it on there three times a day. Did it? Nothing happening, right? It's becoming worse and worse. I make an appointment with another gynecologist. Go see her. She again, doesn't open it. The first uh, first gynecologist was right. It's granulation tissue, all right? Still having a huge amount of problems, right? Still bled. It's harder to dilate now. More blood. I'm putting tampons in now, and I'm filling tampons up, right? This is how two different gynecologists, they did not even open me up. I had some facial surgery up in Bay Area. Marcy moves in with Dr. Beck. I met Dr. Beck, with Mauer, Marcy. I go in there, Mar I was getting something done. Marcy, I said, Marcy, this is what happened. She goes, make an appointment with me when you get your stitches out of your nose or whatever. So I go see Marcy, put my legs up in the stirrups. She goes in, puts the thing in there. She starts swearing. She's going, damn it, Jessica. Did you go see a doctor? I said, yes, and she's she did a biopsy on me, took a biopsy and said, come see me next week. I walk in the office, she hugs me, and she goes, I thought you had full-blown cancer, okay? She goes, you have HPV. If those two other doctors would have given you the proper medicine, it would have been fixed. She goes, now I have to have an inside, I have to have another surgery. I had a DM, it's what's called a DNC, and they had to go in there, basically roto rooter inside of me and cauterize all of this stuff inside of me. One of the most extremely painful surgeries you can imagine. Seriously, think about it. They took the inside of my vagina, mm -hmm. how sensitive that is, that's your penis turned inside out, and they cauterized the inside of it. They filled it with Ugh. packing, filled it with Ow. packing, and they pull out the packing, and I still had to dilate every single day. So here's that all that cauterization, putting in a penis, and it would just spread that fresh, you know what I'm saying? So this went on and I had it. And, and so that's when I said, and then Marcy right then and there, she goes, Jessica, in that room that day, she goes, I'm your gynecologist. So this is what started this relationship with me and Marcy. We became friends. We started this education thing. We started, let's push on education. We've done a few radio shows and we've become sisters you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. not sisters but you know we've become you know. you know and we do a lot of stuff together you know and mm -hmm. we started conferences and so i speak and that's what started this is the healthcare system is getting better for the trans population but it needs to get a bit better when a trans man all right a trans man is you, you see a trans man they take mm -hmm. tea they take tea they get beards they have ball you know what i'm saying they have full hair they get top surgery they're a man they still need pap smears, right? Do you know how embarrassing it is for a man to walk into a gynecologist and say, I need a pap smear? 
Let's start walking around. Let's help these people out, okay? We're just ordinary people. Let's learn. Let's do this kind of stuff when it comes to the TSA for pat-downs. They are <coughs> going to they say, okay, they can see in their x-rays. Let's bring this person behind here so we can ask them, who do you want to be patted down by? It, very, very simple. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Let's, simple let's, little things. That can simple little things. Fun. And I started, I spoke at University of Southern Mississippi just recently. First transgender person ever. I do a lot in the South, okay? Mm -hmm. And because it's need be, you know, it's where the family trees don't have a lot of branches. You know mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and I go in there and they brought in the whole psychology department, sociology department, right? So I'm here, I'm sitting here at lunchtime, we're having a big lunch. And they said, how do we help the transgender community in our school? Right? This is Mississippi, University of Southern Mississippi. I said, the very first thing is you have restrooms around the campus that say, boys or girls and there's nothing in there but a toilet and a sink. They said they're everywhere and I said, why don't you just write restrooms? Why does it have to be a boy or a girl? And they go, there's a two dollar plaque. That simple. That mm -hmm. simple. That and simple they, little thing okay. shows them that you care. All right. Yeah. Down to children. It happened to me yesterday. A young lady came to me. She goes, I'm a teacher. We have a young kid, five years old, coming into school. And I said, you know, anyway, we explained on how to do it. How do we make it more accessible for kids? Well, you go to your teacher and say, you get some teachers that say, this is their birth name on their on their administration think whatever we I'm going to call them by their administration name well you get all those teachers in there and when the kids come into the classroom they go up to you and say I want my name to be Jessica I want it to be Susie I want it to be Taylor whatever and that's what you call them by not John Smith because that's what they're born with you take a little bit of stuff and it's a lot to do with the administrators kids really don't care kids really really don't care they just look at it and say you know what, you're my friend. Who cares what you mm -hmm. have? Kids really don't care. You get some in college, but overall the colleges are pretty damn good. You know, it's the administrators, some huge right-wing administrator that says, no, you can't do this. I'm going to Auburn University, right? First, first trans woman. I already spoke there, but that's their big thing. It's the administration up above theirs, Utah State. Same identical thing. You know, and mm -hmm. it's that's what it is. So we need to help these people understand. Hey, we're just ordinary people. So did we're I answer just the question? Ordinary people. Yeah, yeah, that's a good that's a good answer to the question. Um, and you touched on that you have some children. Um, Tell us a little bit about your children. I mean, did you have them obviously before transition? Yeah. But. Well, I had my three children when I was planning on transitioning. The computer was starting to come out. My two parents were the only one that knew about this. They were the only ones that knew. And I was back and forth, yes, transitioning, and a job opening came for me opening in Los Angeles. I was, they lived up in Yosemite area, and now in Fresno area. And a job opening came for me open in Los Angeles, and that would give me enough money to do my transition. My dad had retired. So I went down to Los Angeles, and I started working on this job. Mm -hmm. And then I started saving between $1,000 to $1,200 a week, and I started putting it towards a nest egg for my transition. And I needed a little bit of money. And this went on for a little while. While on that job, I walked into a lumber yard, and I met a young girl, and I came out to her. You know, well, they didn't come out to her from right then and there. We started hanging out. We started going out. And I came out to her, and she didn't really care, you know, and she accepted me. She'd even pluck my eyebrows, she'd teach me how to do lipstick, and we'd go buy shoes together, and I was certain mm -hmm. to stuff like that. But I slept with her a few, few times, and I got her pregnant, okay? And we really, really, really debated on what to do. And I seriously sat there, and, and, and she said to me, she goes, you can go become a woman at your parents' house, and you, you know, and um, so this went on, and I said, nope, I gotta bring this child into the world. This child, I'm his father, and I, so me and her got married in March of 1991, and August 18th of 1991, my son Jeffrey came into the world, you know? And so here I was, I had no medical insurance, and I paid cash for everything, so he came into the world, and then with, while I was with her, I had a second child, and um, Jeffrey and Bradley, and just 24 and, 20, 24 and 23 now, um, and, uh, and I was a damn good father. Long story short, we got divorced, and um, for one Christmas odd period, um, I was with her, and we had a third child. You know, we got back together. Never remarried, but we got back together. And then split up again, 
went through a huge legal battle in the state of California, a three-year legal battle that cost me $65,000. During this legal battle, she requested a full psychiatric evaluation on the whole family. And during that psychiatric evaluation, she went in there and says, Jeff is a flaming faggot. He wants to be with men. He loves to wear women's clothing. He lives a double life. He wants to be a woman. The judge read it, did not care in California, and gave me full legal physical custody on all three children. On the bench there, he said this is one of the toughest cases he's ever decided, but in all his years on the bench, he had never seen such an incredible father. He gave me right there full legal physical custody. And long story short, she came back. We, she was in a car accident, and I finally came out to her. And um, that's where the rest of it. So I have a right now. I have a 16-year-old son that I haven't seen since he's 10 years old, um, and I haven't spoken to him since he's 12. And um, I have a 23-year-old that I haven't seen. I saw very briefly last year, but he turned during the court battle. He turned aside. My 24-year-old um, joined the Air Force and um, did not care for it. And he's going through some, you know, he's, he's like going through some different channels to do similar, but, you know, and because it wasn't his cup of tea, if that makes sense. Not dropping it, but, you know what I'm saying, to go in a different route. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he has been my biggest, biggest number one support. You know, my 24-year-old son. And um, so. All right. Three boys. Three evil little bastards. No, Don't want to push boundaries, but how about your youngest son? Is I don't know. I don't okay. know anything. Last time I talked to him, he was 12 years old, and it was, Dad, when do I get to see you? When do I get to see you? I love you, Dad. I miss you. Oh. And we talk about My Chemical Romance. He was a huge My Chemical Romance fan. And he was just, Jeffrey lives with you, Dad. Um, Bradley gets to come see you. When do I get to see you? And then I said, it's time we tell Curtis, and that's when she cut off all communication. And I had full custody in any of those time, two years, and it was brought to the judge. In any of those two years, I could have turned up to Texas, showed them the papers, and said, I want my son, and take him home, and bring him home. And I didn't. And then when I said, I want to see my child, she filed a lawsuit. When we turned up to judge, to the court, my attorney handed the judge papers and says, Jessica has full physical legal custody of all three children. And the judge says, not anymore, she doesn't. Curtis has lived in Texas more than six months and removed everything that I had fought for, took it away from me, okay? And um, and like I said, first time in U.S. history is taking a name off a child's birth certificate because I've transitioned, you know? You've told me this a little bit off camera, but can you tell talk a little bit about it if it's not too... Like, yeah, I can talk about anything. I mean, if, could, could you tell us a little bit about the custody battle and the struggle and just the lengths that were gone to ensure that you couldn't have custody of your child? So during the court thing in Texas, as I said, in California, when I came out, I came out to my eldest son. He came back to California and lived with me. My middle son came back to California and met Jessica, and it was a non-issue, okay? Jessica, he met Jessica, and it was like, Dad, you look a little bit different. He was understanding. Then I transitioned. I did my thing. I was on the phone with my youngest son all the time, and it was saying, Dad, when are we going to see you? And then I said, okay, Rachel, it's time we tell Curtis. I emailed her, texted her, I sent her letters, I sent her registered letters, nothing. Then one day I get a letter from the state of Texas saying Rachel is trying to remove my parental rights. And so I went and started looking for attorneys, and every attorney said $100,000. I finally found an attorney named John McCall, and he says, I know her attorney, and I can, um, I, I can get you you know, to get this. So I fly to Texas, and we go in front of the judge, and the judge said two orders that day. He says, you're allowed to talk to your child anytime you want via the telephone only, but if you tell your child that you have transitioned, I am going to personally throw you in jail, okay? I will come to California and throw you in jail. He says, another order, he says, you must have Dr. Ben Albritton located in Dallas, Texas, to do a full-blown psychiatric evaluation on you on or before January 31st, 2013. It's a court order. If I do not have this evaluation, I go to jail, okay? Mm -hmm. I came out of the courtroom, started calling, my, uh, calling the evaluator's office, and his secretary calls me back a few hours later and says, the soonest we can do it is Monday after Thanksgiving of that year, and I think it was 
November 24th or 26th. Okay, I can't remember. And um, so I made my arrangements, came back to California, and it's $3,000. Came back to California, wired them $3,000, plane ticket, car rental, hotel, and I flew back to Texas a couple days after Thanksgiving. As I turn up to Texas, I stop by my attorney's office. My attorney says, he talked to an attorney from the ACLU in New York and they sent him a letter saying, do not, do not, do not use this evaluator. He's a right-wing theology professor that's known in the state of Texas to vote against the LGBT population. He's a student of Biola University. Google Biola University, you can do it right now. And on their home page, it says you condemn transsexuality. It is against God's law. This is the this is as of right now, you can Google it, and it says on their home page is transsexuality is abomination, okay, mm -hmm. of God. Right? And this is who the judge ordered was gonna tell me if I ever see my child again. I go into the evaluator's office, I walk in, and there's pictures of Jesus's and crosses all over the walls, and there's Bibles all over the desk, okay? Start my evaluation. How many men I've been with? What's my relationship? This and that. Two days of intense question, MMPI, all these things. He goes, I need names of 10 to 15 people. I give him 15 names. Half of them were couples, and he starts his investigation, okay? The end of it, it said it has to be done by January 31st, 2013. It's now January 29th. I want to see my child. I'm still not able to talk to my child. I had to file a contempt of court case. I want to talk to my child. And I'm, I want to see my child. And I'm start calling my attorney. So I leave it alone, Jessica. Leave it alone. And I remember saying F you to him on the phone. And I started calling the evaluator's office at um, on, on January 30th. His secretary goes, um, um, let me get back to you. At the very end of the day, on January 30th, she calls me. She goes, Jessica, your evaluation is done, but it took a little bit longer than we thought. It's an extra $1,500, okay? Call my attorney. goes, you have no choice. I wired them the money. So on January 31st, I wired them $1,500. And the very end of the day, January 31st, the evaluation comes back in. It came about 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock that night. It's a 22-page document, and it says that Jessica is the better parent, that I should start seeing my child immediately. In fact, during the case, the evaluator even emailed the judge and said, what Rachel is doing to this child is dangerous and it's against the law in Texas. This is what their own evaluator said. Mm -hmm. The judge, her attorney says, and my attorney says, I'm going to make a phone call tomorrow and see when you can start seeing your child. It took two and a half weeks for them to get together for a five-minute phone conversation. My attorney calls me, gets off the phone, he goes, it's going to take you several hundred thousand dollars to ever talk to your child again. He wanted to write ten, twenty thousand dollars right then and there. I had no more money. I was broke. Went back and forth. Ended up firing. He wanted off the case. And I started looking for other attorneys. And they all said the same thing. It's hundreds of thousands of dollars. Finally... An attorney for the ACLU said, go file for your own thing. So in June of 2013, me and my eldest son went in front of the judge and said, we want to see my child. Here is your evaluation. They would not, even though it was a court order, if I don't do it, I go to jail. The judge would not allow one word of that evaluation in the court document. Nothing. In the stand, she gets under oath and says, I never knew that Jeff wanted to be a girl, right? We pull out an L.A. Superior Court document with a wax ring on it, never been opened, hand it to the bailiff, the judge opens it, reads it, and he goes, not admissible. Even though it sits there and says, I knew Jeff wanted to be a girl. My eldest son, 21 years old, gets on the stand. Both me and her attorney said, Jeffrey, when did you and your mom talk about your dad transition? He said, when my dad came to Christmas in June of 2009, and he left back to California. My mom came to me and said, did your dad tell you he's going to transition to a woman? And they talked about it. And he said, yes. And, he, and her th said was, what do you think about it? And, and he goes, I'm going to go back to California and help my dad. She gets on the stand under oath and says, my son is lying and should go to jail for lying. That's her own child. Her own child? She her wanted own, to throw her own jail, child in jail prove, just to get back at you? To prove her innocence oh. that she did not know. And the judge knew this, right? So at the end of the day of the judgment, the judge goes, go home 
and I will email you my results. And I, he actually yelled at me and said, me and Jeffrey came here one way. I've never laid a finger on my child. I've done nothing wrong. There's your goddamn evaluation. I've done nothing. She's not about this. The judge yelled at me and says, go home and I'll email you my results. So that was a Monday. Came home Friday morning, turned on the computer, and there it is, St. Jessica Lynn, your parental rights have been terminated. They say I abandoned my child. I want my choice of lifestyle. Then I abandoned my child, right? So the next day, right, my little brother, what was the heartbroken is, right? The next day, that day, my little brother is an attorney for the ACLU in California. Mm -hmm. And he worked in, you know, in different things. He worked for Johnny Cochran's law firm. And he was on the phone with him all day because I was crying and crying and crying. You know, here's my little child. He never allowed mm -hmm. to see again. He was 12 years old at the time. Um, my little brother goes, now the ACLU will get involved. Now Transgender Law Center, now Lambda Legal will jump in. And he worked for ACLU. On Monday, I'll help you file a thing. That was on a Friday. The next day was a Saturday. I had a boyfriend at the time, and he lived, I lived in a place called um, Grover Beach. He worked in San Luis Obispo, and he lived in a Tascadero. And my routine was I would go home with him on Saturday and spend the night, whatever, all day Sunday, whatever. Saturday, we met in San Luis Obispo at his work. We went to a friend of mine's party, and I'm following him home. About 7 o'clock at night, I'm about a mile, a quarter mile from his house. You know what I mean? He's in front mm -hmm. of me. My phone rings. And it's my sister saying, Jessica, where are you? And I said, I'm at my boyfriend's wife. And she goes, our little brother just committed suicide. Okay? This was the day after. So I left my boyfriend. I come to my mom's house, and she was just sitting there. He didn't die of a suicide. He died of a drug overdose. But that night, I was told of a suicide. So we spent the next few weeks burying my little brother. He had three small children dealing with my mom that was her youngest child is now dead, right? Her older, my my my, my dad had already died and my, one of my brothers had dropped dead of a heart attack. So now her youngest child was dead. So we dealt with that for a few weeks and dealt with my mom. So then a few weeks later, I pull out my computer and I said, time to file an appeal, right? Now the ACLU. I turn on my computer, type in it in, it says, in the state of Texas, you have 30 to 90 days to file an appeal. Open it up, dig down a little bit, except when you lose parental rights, you have 21 days, okay? There was one little loophole in the hall, never saw it. It was at day 23. Oh, Not a damn thing I could do. That so devastating. I started calling the doc, I started calling everybody, I'll sell you, there's nothing you can do, Jessica. So you can imagine how absolute devastating that was, right? Mm -hmm. Just devastated 2013, <coughs> cried and cried and cried. It was just horrible, right? The end of 2013 rolls around, it's Christmas Eve. My son and his girlfriend go to San Diego. I'm alone on Christmas Eve. I come in, I had a little clothing boutique, I'm alone. Open up the mailbox, December 24th. I open up the mailbox and there's a yellow envelope and I showed on my screens when I display it in my classrooms. Two from her attorney to me, Jessica Lynn, dated December 21st, 2013. There's this postmark on it. I opened it up as a stack of papers. December 20th, 2000, they wrote it on Friday, December 20th, right? Open it up. Please find an enclosed copy of the order of termination. So they sent it again. So I would receive it on Christmas Eve just to say, fuck you. You're never allowed to see your child again, right? They, they sent went, you a note on Christmas, Christmas Eve, Eve doing that? On Christmas Eve, okay. Then they went a little bit farther. On Christmas Eve, on that same letter, it says, Jessica Jeffrey Butterworth's name my name shall be removed from the birth certificate of this child. And it was dated and stamped in September 20th of 2013, but they waited till Christmas Eve to send the letter, just to say, F you, a little bit harder, just to say oh. you're never, so first time in US history that that has ever happened to a transgender person to have their name removed. You hear parents losing parental rights, or not parental rights so much, but guardian, or they, they get to see their child under care or whatever, but never, never, never has anybody. That's how far this Texas judge went. He's elected official. So that's why, that's what started me saying, we're going to change the world so that his child doesn't have an issue. Anybody in the world, I go to college classes all the time. These are our future teachers, future doctors, our future leaders, and our future politicians. You know, Ted Cruz goes to these colleges. I go to Princeton. I go to University of Pennsylvania. I'm going to Harvard. These are the students that are going to learn. You know, mm -hmm. so preaching the choir here. So Jessica, what has been the happiest part of your journey? Like what has been the best part 
happiest moment so far in your journey? Being true to myself, feeling comfortable in my skin, just and helping people learn about us. Okay, that, that every day, every day is better than the last day, if that makes sense to you. Last night I helped a young lady helping with a young child. To me, that's a difference. I'll travel all the way to um, Indianapolis and I'll speak to one person and that's worth my whole summer of traveling, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. One person, and I know I'm helping more than one person. So every day is a new experience, is helping people understand or becoming true to themselves or whatever, so no less, there's less and less discrimination and more and more kids feeling comfortable that they're not alone in this world. So there's not one specific thing, there's numerous, numerous, numerous things and being able to look in the mirror and say, I like what I see, you know. That's a big one, that is a big one, you gotta yeah. learn to love yourself. Yeah. I need to lose a little weight, and I want to have a little bit of hair, and I can't wait till my hair gets a little longer. But that's just, you know, cosmetic stuff. Mm -hmm. People say, do you feel, um, one of the common questions is, do you feel it's enough? You know, do you, do you feel like your surgeries are done? Yeah, I do. But we always want to look better. We want to get our hair done differently. We want our nails to look perfect. And that's just female things looking prettier. You know, mm -hmm. that's just common, everyday things. So um, I'm very, very content of where I've come. So. Well, we've talked about the happiest part of your journey, and let's move on to what has been the most difficult part of your journey. My two children. Okay, and that, of course, is when the judge said, you're never allowed to see your child again. That, to me, is just mind-boggling. And just being away from my child, especially my youngest, okay, is the most hurtful thing you can ever imagine. My own little child, my own boy. I used to kiss and hold his hand and walk him down the street and take him to school. I'm never allowed to talk to him again, you know? This is my only child. Not my only child, but my little boy, my child. And I'm not even allowed to be a father. I don't care that I look a little different. He would have, he would have accepted it within days, mm -hmm. you know? And yet a judge said, because I am what I am, I'm not even good enough to be a parent. So that has been the most absolute difficult thing that I've gone through. And it's just wrong to do that to a parent. Just, to a human being. To a human, a human being yeah. in general. That is just so you know, wrong. They treat to animals you are better. Unfit to be oh. around a child, yet give the same kind of rights to a sex offender. Yes. You know? yeah. Part of our show is that we ask people, um, you know, if there's a message that they'd like to share with the trans community or the cis community. If you have a message for the trans community, um, what what is what would that message be today? My biggest thing is I get questioned that a lot is towards a young person saying do I or do I not. My biggest thing is you got if you know what you're going to do it three words go for it. Never 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 live the life for somebody else. Okay, you get people saying I'd had it two days ago in Washington the other side of Washington saying this young boy that wants to transition to a woman, the father doesn't accept it. Does this young kid live with his father? No. Does that father have to look at that child every single day? No, he's 23, 24 years old. You know, your dad's going to go, this is your life. Who am I? Who's your father? Who's your mother to say that you have to follow exactly by this rule and this rule? You have to live your life. You have to be comfortable looking in that mirror and saying, this is me. I have to feel good looking in that mirror. I have to be comfortable being me. Live your life truthfully. It would solve a lot of problems in this world. Stop suicide, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, all these medications that they keep misdiagnosing and saying, okay, you're bipolar, you're this or that. Why don't you just be true to yourself? You know what I'm saying? Don't hurt anybody. And, and why, why can't the world accept us for who we are? You know? Mm -hmm. That's the hardest part is like it's, the world just cannot accept us for who we are. And we're just trying to be just human beings, human beings mm -hmm. out there, you know, just have our lives. And, yeah. I mean, what message would you like to share with the cisgender or, or non-transgender people who may be watching today? I want them to learn of the acceptance, right? There may be a thousand people watching today. Out of that thousand, 
10 of them, 20 of them may have children in the future, and one of them is going to come, or, you know, all of them are going to have children, whatever. 20 of those kids are going to come and say, Mom, Dad, I want to be a boy, or I want to be a girl, or I may be gay, or I may be this, or I may be bisexual, or I may want to be somewhere in the middle. I may want to be both genders. And those parents are going to have to say, that's my child. I don't care. When we're in their womb, how many parents say, I don't care if it's a boy or a girl, as long as he's healthy, right? But when they come out and they say, well, if he's trans, he's out of the house. You know how many students, how many kids are kicked out of the house, are turned to the streets, turned to drugs, commit suicide because mom or dad doesn't accept them or their religion doesn't accept them. And the, what I want is to teach the world about acceptance, that we are all unique individuals. It'd be a very, very boring place if we were all fit into that same box. And that is my goal and my way of doing is reaching as many people as humanly possible to help them. And that's why when I go to a college or a university or whatever, I've done high schools, I want those people to be able to ask me any anything that they physically want. If they want to email, they want to question me, I'll go sit and have a cup of coffee with them for three hours. I don't care. I want those people to understand that this is who we are. We're not going anywhere, people. No. So if you want to just try to push it out of the way, uh, <laughs> yeah. good luck. But it's yeah. <laughs> and we got to teach them all how to be transgender. <laughs> just yeah, turn the trans them trans agenda, number one, become human. Yeah. Number two, see number one. Yeah. Or yeah. be considered human. Yeah. Okay, um, looking back, would you have done anything differently? I would have come out, I mean, there's a, there, there's a catch-22 here. I would have come out when I was a young child. My life would have been beautiful, easy, comfortable, no suicide. But I wouldn't have met Barbara, or I may have met her, and I may have been friends with her, and been a best friend with her as I became as friends with her, but I wouldn't have had my children, okay? It's a catch-22 because my kids are my life. Now if it comes back to where I had my kids, when I would have transitioned, I would have kept my kids with me. My youngest one would have accepted me. When I went and picked him up in third grade once, his teacher comes to me and goes, Mr. Butterworth, did you know your child? And she goes, I want to talk to you. And I said, why, what's up? And she goes, there's a young child in this classroom that goes to the bathroom. He wears, di he wears diapers to school. None of the other boys would play with him because he has incontrollable bowel syndrome, right? Mm -hmm. Except for your son. Your son is one of the most popular students in this class, and your son is the only one to play with him. On the way home, I said, what's up, Curtis? What do you, you know, and he goes, he's my friend. He's my friend, Michael. He's my friend. Nobody else, who cares? But that's my son that was turned against. Well, I don't know if he's turned against me. That's who, who the judge said, because I am who I am, I'm never allowed to talk to you. He would have been the most accepting of me out of my three children. And yet society has said, I'm not, you know, I'm wrong. So when I would have done my transition, I would have kept them all with me and just pushed her out, you know. But I did it thinking it was the best and I made a mistake because she is an evil person. There's no other sense of about it, you know, and she used religion as the thing. Mm -hmm. And it's just, what kind of person, <coughs> human being, would turn their child away against the other parent just because they're a little bit different? Okay, what if I lost my penis in Iraq? Does that make me less of a person? Okay. No, it does not. Okay. You no, it does not. Okay. That's what I'm saying. Is that simple? Because I dress different. Because I am who I am. And they went as far as saying, you're never going to be a parent to your own child because you look different. Because you are different. Because, you know. And they used God. And that's what the most disgusting thing about it. Because if you're truly, I'm not a, I'm not, I'm an atheist, but if you truly follow that Bible that they believe on, that they use, like the Christian group uses to not go to the bathrooms, the million people that march it, they use God. A friend of mine put a million, a half a million dollars on the table to an organization. She said, show me in that Bible where it says that we are not human, you know, that we are not, they could not do it. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And, um, you know, I mean, so it's just a facade. It's a facade. Okay. The thing that I want to make, or the point I want to make right now is that Jesus wasn't a Christian. Buddha wasn't a Buddha yeah. or a Buddhist. I mean, they were. They taught love. Yeah. Love is the religion. Yeah. Love yeah. brings us closer. It binds us all. It's the energy that flows in everything because it, it's an energy that can, not, that can be neither created nor destroyed. It has to be harnessed. Yeah. Kind of like right, you know, all energy. What do you think they would do to Jesus if he came into this world right now? They would burn him at a stake. These Christians, these right-wing Christians, mm -hmm. their beloved leader would be, you know what I'm saying? Would the be... worst part is being trans, and I mean, 
I don't know if you've ever been, uh, you know, assaulted or abused. I'm lucky but, I haven't. Yeah. You know, being the being the victim of abuse in a bathroom for being trans, and then being accused of being the abuser, yeah. is just so so. It's like a slap in the face every time I get that from yeah. people. Yeah. 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 You know, it's just it's so frustrating. Oh, um, trust me. And then yeah, it's I like you use God as your fallback for that. Yeah. I mean, that's not what a good Christian or religious person would do. They would never use their God as a fallback to do hate. And there's a state, and I want to say it's Illinois, I may be wrong, forgive me, but 51 Christian families are suing the, uh, the school district because one young girl, transgender girl, is using the restroom. Mm -hmm. They're schooling the school district saying that she's making the rest of the school feel uncomfortable by going to the bathroom behind closed doors and going pee. So she, they, they're they saying that that one girl going to the bathroom is making the whole school feel uncomfortable because she's using the restroom in a girl's restroom, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, seventh, eighth grade girl. So that's the kind of mentality. And it's all Christians, you know, they use... Well, there are other religions too, but the majority, no, that are, the yeah, majority yeah, of the yeah, hate that's being seen in America right yeah. now is from. It's the Christians. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it, it really is. You know, you don't see it coming from the Muslims. You don't see it from. I did. I went into a, a, a um, hotel just recently, and the young girl behind the counter, she was Muslim. She goes, "No, you're all just equal to me." You know, this is coming from a Muslim. You know, mm -hmm. she goes, "No, it's just who cares?" You know, and. Um, so. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I totally, totally appreciate it. And thank you for what you are doing. I think it's Aww. wonderful. And I love your state of Washington here. And I've already been invited back. So uh, it looks mm -hmm. like I'll be back here in September, October at both the university. Well, actually, three or four universities. So we're already scheduling. So thank you. Thank and you. bless you. Thank you. Thank you.